For our opening keynote, if there is such a thing as a household name in the world of coaching and mentoring, then Professor David Clutterbuck very well might be that person. I've had a look at the biography in the program, and I think it's characteristically modest, and that we can't underestimate the contribution that David has made to our practice. You probably very well have one or more of his books on your shelf. His work, his research has probably informed your practice. Exploring the theme of moving to mastery for our opening keynote for the third annual conference, if I could please ask you to welcome Professor David Clutterbuck. Thank you, David. One of the things that I often say when I just start off a, a, a speech of this kind is that in coaching, if you know where the conversation is going, it's not coaching. And if you think about it, you know, if, you, if you get that sense, well, I know exactly what's going to happen here, you are probably falling into your role as expert rather than your role as a coach. And so what, what, I, what I've actually, I haven't got any slides. I've got a bunch of bits and pieces, papers here. I want to focus on memes. Now, I, I don't know if you are all familiar with the term meme, M-E-M-E. -E. It's, it's basically a meme is a concept, an evolving concept or, or, or an idea. In fact, what I, my definition of a meme is an idea with attitude. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an idea that's actually out there and is evolving and is changing the way people think and therefore the way that people behave. And so what I, what I plan to do is to present some memes for you and some questions that go around those memes and let you basically decide which ones you want to think about a, a bit more. And I'm going to get a five minute warning before I need, to, I need to shut up the formal bit and then we'll just throw it open for questions and anything else that you may want to say. I'm going to focus on four areas because I need to focus somehow. Um, and and, and the, first, the first of those areas is the organisation, what's happening. And in particular, I'm going to focus on the issue of coaching culture. The, the concept of coaching culture is an evolving one because culture evolves and our concept of what culture is, therefore our concept of what a coaching culture is evolving. The second area I'm going to talk about is the profession. And the third area is the individual coach. And then I'm going to, and also I'm going to talk about the systems that interlink them all. And I'm going to start by just saying something about systems. We are systems. Each one of us is a community, a colony of bacteria. And the way that we think, what we have for breakfast today, will affect our gut bacteria, which is affecting the way that we are thinking and the way that we behave. Everything around us, within us, is a system. And our awareness of ourselves as a system is pretty, pretty poor, because, and our awareness of the systems going on around us is poor. We are all mem members of multiple systems. And those systems, there's multiple layers to those systems. The system of our family, the system of our close working relationships, the system of the team, the organisation, society, everything. We are all part of multiple systems. And what is coaching but a way of having conversations that helps us raise our awareness of what's going on in those systems, the internal systems and the external systems, and actually make better decisions about how we work within those. Um, and so I think you know, understanding that what we're doing as coaches is just opening the window a bit, because most of what goes on in our internal systems and our external systems is a complete mystery to us. In fact, our whole brain is designed to stop us thinking about these things because we go nuts if you're autistic. One of the reasons that you struggle to cope within the, modern, within, within the world is that you have too many stimuli. Your brain records too much of this stuff, and it hurts, quite literally, in some cases. And so what we do is we filter things out. We, 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 we use language as a, as a filter. And it's interesting, some of the studies of language now sh show that, the, that if we have a word for something, it shapes the way that we think about it. So one of the studies somebody was telling me about the other day was a study they're doing about the word power or the concept of power. And why Americans and, and Russians too, so the, why some nations so fixated upon power, and particularly individual power? And the thesis that's being presented there is that, it, that they, they are fixated on power because they've only got one word for it. Whereas if you have multiple words to describe it, so if you have words for different kinds of power, do exercise in different ways, you might think about power in a completely different way. It would change the way that you think. So sometimes what we're doing as coaches is helping people find words or expressions for things, concepts they haven't considered because that's the way that they change the way that they think and therefore the way that we behave. We are in the business of creating new vocabulary. And sometimes we quite literally create new words. I mean, one word that, that uh, I'm, I'm quite proud of having created 20, 30 years ago is the word simplexity. 
which is the art of making complex things simple, but not simplistic. What we also try and do as human beings, and the way that we survive, is to create coherence. We are constantly striving to get a coherent, coherent picture so we can decide on things. Because if all of this confusion out there, all these systems interacting, it's impossible to actually understand it all, and therefore we try and we create narratives against which we try and act. And those narratives can get very fixed, or those narratives we can occasionally shift. But the narratives, they help us survive, they also constrain us. When I was starting out as a young journalist, my, my mentor, one of my mentors, was the great management thinker Peter Drucker. Um, and I only met him a few times, but he became my role model. At a seminar with him one, one day, he said something that, that really caught my imagination. He was joking. What he says, he said, you know, sometimes he said, you get to a sort of level of eminence as a, as a speaker, in, in his Eastern European voice. Um, and he said, you know, you need a statistic. He said, and you haven't got one. And it's really frustrating. So I find it helpful just to make one up. <laughs> and I thought, what a great idea. So what I did the no very next week, I, did, I created a hypothesis, and we, did, we created this experiment. So the t conference for the Financial Times... I, I waited, it was on customer care, and I waited until sort of halfway through the, the, my speech, and then I just made up the statistic on the spot to see what would happen. And the statistic was, it always takes at least five times more, or costs at least five times more, to get a new customer than to keep an old one. Now, you may have heard that statistic a few times. <laughs> in fact, you'll find it in something like 94% of all the articles and books about, 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 uh, about customer care. Um, and about 60% of people will realise that I made that statistic up as well. Um, <laughs> and about 10% of people will still haven't quite got the message, but those are mostly Corbynistas and members of UKIP. Um, <laughs> the point being that the, na that, 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 and, that, that, that the narrative we have here is, we, 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 why do we believe such a statistic? Um, and, and, the, and the great Nobel Prize winner, um, Daniel Kahneman, whose book, if you haven't read it, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, is fantastic. You know, I've been, been corresponding about this, and he's been sort of mentoring me along on some of the way, some of the, to understand some of this. The issue is, we have a set of narratives in our head. And if something happens that, that, that's a new experience or a, piece of, or a piece of information, we compare it to the rest of the narratives, the story that we're telling ourselves. If it fits, we believe it. We don't question it. If it doesn't fit, then we, do, we sideline it. We tune it out, like we do all the other uh, uh, miscellaneous messages. The problem is, we basically, as coaches, are we colluding with our clients to reinforce the narratives they have, or are we helping them to create new narratives? When they come to a solution about something, is that solution based in their existing narrative or is that solution based in a narrative they need to have or a conversation they need to have with themselves? And that's a question that's almost unanswerable. But for me, I think it's one of the most powerful questions in coaching at the moment. You know, looking at the systems of which people are a part, how do we actually help them to pull apart their narratives and work out where their existing narratives are actually the problem, not part of their solution? I, I don't have a simple answer. It's, uh, but it's one of the things that, we, that, we, that is, I think is fascinating. Two examples of systems at work. One is, is, is a whole program of, of what's called maternity mentoring. Maternity mentoring started in the 19, early 1990s. Um, and then something came, maternity coaching came along. Um, and maternity coaching is, is where somebody from, who's been a mum themselves and has come back to, come back to work, um, but now sets themselves up as a coach specialising in, in this area. And that's great, it's really valuable. But what turns out that maternity mentoring turns out to be much more uh, useful is because the culture, the memes, the systems in an organisation are the big, most difficult things to get linked into. Once you've left the organisation, you have evolved as an individual and the organisation has evolved. And having somebody who's still part of that organisation, who has been part of the evolving identity and the memes within that organisation, who can work with you, as you, as you re-establish your connections and re-establish your value in the organisation, turns out to be much more valuable and useful. 
And so it's the systems connection that sometimes somebody who is with expertise can bring. And in, incidentally, in, in the MCC, one of the thing, conversations we had at our, our last international conference uh, uh, was we, we got together a lot of people to, to try and bottom out this, this vexed question of what's coaching one, what's mentoring. And it's a waste, waste, of, waste of time most of the time to agree, it's because the two cross over each other so, so much. But what we did in the end was to actually to identify what is a, diff, what is a coach and what is a mentor. And if you think of, of, of a definition, and it's a definition, not the definition of a coach, as someone who supports clients in achieving developmental goals through the use of learning dialogue in a supportive environment. I'll say that again. Some, they support clients in achieving development goals through the use of learning dialogue in a supportive environment. Then you add as a mentor, a mentor has context-specific ex expertise or knowledge and the skills to apply these in supporting the learning in a non-directive coaching style why a lot of people now start referring to mentoring as coaching plus, and why we're seeing a whole new profession, so-called, of professional mentor. Because it's, it's coaches who are, have specific experience which they can use in a non-directive, client-centered way. Um, and that, it really is, that's full circle, because you know, men, coaching in its modern form comes from, uh, in part from the ancient, from, from the, the, uh, um, the European traditions of mentoring anyway. So, there is, that's, so, so I think this whole systemic issue is one that, 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 that needs a lot more thinking about. We are, when we are stepping into a coaching conversation, we are stepping into the systems of the client. And our, our role is to help them understand those systems a little bit more so that they can actually make changes of their own. It's helping them to be realistic that when you make a change, you're doing it within the context of the narrative that you're telling. And actually what's happening out there may be different, but at least you're, trying to, you're helping them with enough coherence. So a quick question is, how much coherence of narrative does somebody need in order to survive, and how much coherence of narrative does somebody need in order to grow? And where is the emphasis of our coaching? So that's one area. Second area, let's look at the, at the, at the organizations. So if we, look at, if, if we see what's happening in, in organizational cultures, um, there aren't many examples of real coaching cultures. We, when we did our original research, we found that there were four, we identified four levels of coaching culture. There, there was nascent, which, which is basically, there's a lot of uncoordinated initiatives, um, there's hardly any role models, um, and there's a, a, genuine avoid, gen, a, a, genuine, a general avoidance of difficult conversations in the organisation. Um, by the sec second level, which we call ta tactical, um, people are still vague about what a coaching culture looks like, um, and how it can help company performance or organizational performance. Um, but there's a lot of good practice going on that people can draw on. There's some good role models around. At the strategic level, which is level three, there's a clear corporate coaching strategy. And, a, and, and, and there's investment around that strategy so that these are the things, the elements of what makes a coaching culture, these are the things we're going to put into place. Um, and there's some integration between HR systems um, and, and HR management systems with the coaching, with coaching practice. And then when you get to embedded, basically, here people at all levels are engaged with coaching conversations, and coaching conversations become the default. And people at the top spend more of their time in coaching-style conversations than they do in transactional conversations, for example. Now, you can see why it's so hard to get to that top level. Um, and when we talk to organisations, in, in our current piece of research, what we've been looking at is, what is the biggest issue? The biggest issue is the fact that leaders um, become less and less coaching-oriented as they go up the, the corporate tree. And part of this is a systems issue, because the, the systems that we surround ourselves with actually force line managers or, and senior managers more and more away from thinking like humans. Um, and we, we, in, in studies of banking, for example, what's one of the things that's been found is that um, the symbols that you see when you look around you, when you see figures, when everything that you, or, or the NHS with targets, whenever you look at people, people with numbers, people are less ethical. Um, when you surround people, people with pictures of peop people, people become more ethical. Um, and then, so, so there's the external systems going on here. And there's the internal systems too. The internal systems are quite, um, we, have, we have, it turns out, an ethical balance. And the ethical balance means basically that if we, if we um, 
if we do something, something, if we kick the cat as we go out the door in the, in the morning because we're, we're feeling grumpy, um, we feel obliged to do something good to somebody, to be nice to somebody, in, or, in order to compensate for it. So we restore our, our, our sense of, of ethical equilibrium. And vice versa. Uh, if we do something really nice, we put some, if we put some money in the tramps, in the tramps uh, um, hat as we, as, as we walk past, it justifies us in doing something unethical when we get back into the work, and, you know, uh, you know, pinching the soap from the hotel or whatever. Um, we, so we've got these ethical balances. All of these systems are at work. Um, and one of the, things, the emerging areas of coaching, which I'm finding really fascinating to work with, in, is, is ethical coaching or ethical mentoring. And what we're doing, what we're doing here, we're working with London Business School, um, the, 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 with, with the NHS for, on this, for example. We're basically equipping coaches and coach pools within, within organisations with the skills of, or the un, an understanding of eth- the psychology of ethicality and the tools to. To, to be coaches or mentors to people in the organization to help them work through ethical dilemmas and to help them build ethical resilience and to become consciences within, that, within those organizations. And what we, find, what we found, and it's still a small number of examples so we can't draw enormous conclusions from it, but what we found is there is a phenomenon that's happening in organizational cultures where you've got a pool of coaches that after a while your internal coaches get bored because they're doing the same sort of thing all the time. Um, and they don't feel particularly recognized or supported or whatever, even if you're providing new, on, ongoing training and so forth for them. But give them something like this to get their teeth into, and they become totally revitalized. Um, and from the, the, the feedback that we've got from, from, from those coaches who've, been, who've taken on this role of ethical mentor or ethical coach, um, the, the kind of things that people bring... Once people know that there's an ethical coach in the organisation, they almost get inundated with, 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 regu- with requests for help because you know, most organisations are operating in climates where the values of the individuals are being squeezed against, uh, against the, the, real, the op- real values of the, of, 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 of that's the people that they feel that they should be holding, which the organisation in theory espouses but doesn't actually practice. So the whole range of issues happening here. When we look at what a coaching culture is like, we see there's all, there's all sorts of things. But there's, there's one of the things is, 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 is the way that the, the responsibility for coaching is, is distributed. We see, for, <coughs> for example, that uh, it's typical for coaching to uh, be seen as something that um, is the responsibility of the line manager or, or, the, or the external coach. But it's the coach's responsibility to coach. What we're increasingly seeing in, co- in organizations where there is a coaching culture or the beginnings of a coaching culture is the accountability for coaching is shared with the coachee. Indeed, perhaps in many cases, the coachee is the predominant owner of the process, not the coach. Now, let me just ask you, how, when you are coaching people, can you honestly say to me that, that most of the time, most of the accountability lies with the client? It's a fundamental question. Where does the accountability for coaching come from? If you're a line manager coach, is coaching something you go to people and say, would like you to do? I'd like to, you know, I'd, I'd like to give you some coaching on this. Or I think, I think I should coach you around this. Or is coaching something people come and ask you for because they will value it as an input from you? These are big questions that I think underpin um, the, the concept of, of, of coaching culture. Um, there are all sorts of other little indicators. One of the indicators we found was, was that people in, in an organization that's, working, that's getting towards a coaching culture, when people look for their next job, they don't look outside the organization first, they look inside the organization first. Whereas in most organizations, it's the other way around. It's much less, th- less threatening to look outside the organization for another job because you're not le- your own line manager. You don't have to have those difficult conversations with your line manager. Um, there are all sorts of links here with appraisal systems and various other things, so internal corporate systems, um, which are increasingly being, being questioned. Yeah. It, and the way that we manage talent, um, I promise not to get too deeply in, into that because that's a whole diff- different topic, but basically the way, that, the, way, the way that organizations define talent and manage talent actually affects the, their ability to become a coaching culture. If you have a traditional um, sense of what constitutes talent, you are probably... You, you, your coaching may actually be undermining diversity, for example. 
and I'll come back to that one in, in, a, little, in, in a little while. So some, one of the, 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 the big issues is the line manager as coach. Can line managers be effective coaches? Um, can internal groups of coaches be effective? Um, or as effective as those that are outside? We've looked in vain for any evidence that is any credible evidence at all that your internal professionally or accredited coach is, 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 is less effective or less valuable than your externals. We can't find a single piece of credible evidence that says that an external coach is better than an internal coach. None. Now, it may be some, that, some there, but, there, but certainly it's hiding, it's hiding itself away very, very carefully. And indeed, we find some evidence to the contrary because the internal coach has enough contextual under knowledge of the organization to be able to put things far, far, far in, in, to put, you know, to see the nuances behind things that are being said, to understand the memes of that organization. Now, you can say, yes, if you're somebody is a very, at a very senior level, there is a sort of comfort factor to being coached by somebody from outside the organization. But, you know, that aside, in terms of actual coaching ability, we can't find any significant difference. What we can also find in terms of uh, find is that the coaching culture increasingly, the emphasis of whether you can achieve a coaching culture is not about big initiatives, it's about the team. And the team is the fulcrum for creating a coaching culture. We did some, we did some work, it was not, not an empirical study, and we just ran around asking loads and loads of people what happens when your boss goes on a co or went on a line manager's coach course. You know, the sheep dip. Well, the first thing that, that, that we found was, well, first, how, and how long did the new behaviours last? How long do you think the new behaviours lasted, on average? Three days. <laughs> um, this was not very helpful, especially as many of the courses actually lasted three days. So, you know, yeah, that, was, that, was, that was a real investment. <clears throat> and we, what, happened, when, when, what, what happened when they get, they get back into, into the workplace, and they start behaving differently, I'm going to do some coaching. Um, and the first thought of people is, I wonder what pills he's on, can I have some? Um, uh, and, 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 the, and the second thought is, this is uncomfortable. And it's uncomfortable because if they're doing it well, they're making their team think. And they're not used to that. That's your job, you're the manager, you do the thinking. Um, if he's doing it not so well, it becomes clunky and mechanical and robotic, and it's still uncomfortable. And so when, the, when the, something happens, there's a crisis, and they automatically revert to their normal behavior um, very quickly, um, everybody breathes a sigh of relief and says, right, forget that stuff. And, they go, and, and so the impact of straightforward line management coaching courses is minimal, we've been at, we find. What does seem to work, and, a number, and there have been a variety of experiments, people like ASDA, National Grid, and so forth, is to actually look at, at creating a coaching culture in the team itself. So helping the, te helping the team take responsibility and the line manager together to take responsibility for building this coaching culture in their working environment, creating the, the psychological safety for it. Everybody taking responsibility for coaching both themselves and each other, and that includes the team coaching the boss when appropriate. Um, what we also found was that it was important to work on things that were, that, that were relevant to the team itself, um, uh, so that it was real issues they were working on, and to spread it over time, because coaching is a mindset. You don't learn coaching in one go. You have to go and practice and reflect upon it. So that's probably enough about coaching culture. Uh, let me just say something about this, the, the, the profession. Accreditation has become more and more important, and it has a really a, a strong role to play. But what's it worth? And that's one of those uncomfortable questions. What is accreditation actually worth? It makes coaches more mindful. It gives you some confidence that they've at least done some study and so forth. But the evidence of, of coach assessment centers, which have been validated by, 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 the, IC, by the ICF, the AC, the MCC, the BPS, the CIPD, uh, APEX, um, is that actually there is, there is no significant correlation between the number of hours of coaching that somebody has done and their competence as a coach. No significant correlation at all. There is no significant correlation between the fees that somebody charges. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what title somebody gives themselves. If, it, if that title is based upon input measures, 
such as number of hours that you've done or number of courses that you've attended, it doesn't make you an effective coach. It simply says that you've, got, you've attended a lot of courses and you've done a lot of coaching. And in the assessment centres, we found people who've claimed to have done four or 5,000 hours of coaching, and all we can say is, heaven help the, the people who are... And, and, and what, what comes out of this is, is actually, what we're looking here is, 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 is a much more systemic process again. The create, to, to, to become, to re achieve real mastery as a coach, you have to go through a number of, 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 of mindsets, of ways of thinking about it. And that's really hard to do. It doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. And, it, and, and the, the critical component appears to be the quality of the reflection that somebody does on their practice. Um, and so what we found through these the observations of hundreds of coaches at work um, was there were four, these four layers. Layer number one is the models-based coach. Now, they basically have got a model. Uh, they've probably got the grow model, you know, get rich on waffle. Um, uh, <laughs> and and, they, and they, they basically have got, that's all they've got. So everything that anybody brings them has got to fit that model. So they're basically doing coaching to somebody. Um, a high proportion of coaches, and I don't know, we, don't, we can't put an exact percentage on it, but, I, but, but an estimated percentage is, is about 50 to 55% of coaches get beyond that. Although professional coaches, that is, get beyond that. Which leaves a hell of a lot stuck at that level. Um, but they, they move to, to what we would call process-based, or pro the process level. Now, here you've got a, a wider portfolio of, of, of tools and techniques. You've begun to integrate them, and you've got things to play with, so you can allow the conversation to happen a bit more. And here what you're, tr you're, you're trying to do is to do coaching with the client. And you're allowing the client to, 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 to actually lead, to take the lead on a lot of things, and you're adjusting the way that you, you, you work according to how... To, 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 um, to your sensitivities around where, what the possibilities are for this person. A, small, a proportion of these people go move to the next level. And that, and that level, it, we, we would call, uh, call discipline or, or, or based or, 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 or I think it's the second thing, the other word. Let's call it, just call it discipline based for the moment. Um, uh, but it, uh, but, but it, it's about philosophy based. So it's about, how, it's, it's about how you integrate all your learning as a coach and all the studying you've been doing and all the practice you've got into who you are. So you've stopped doing coaching and you started being a coach. And this is a radical shift in the way that you think and the way you behave and the kinds of behaviours you, you exhibit. And the fourth level, which we see in a tiny percentage of people, but wow, are they great. Um, we, we, we would call the systemic eclectic. We're back to systems again. These people see the client and their systems in a much more complex way. Or they understand the complexity of the client and their systems. They, they, they say very little. They speak for less than 20% of the time that the, that the models-based coaches do. They, we would describe them as helping the client or holding the client while the client has the conversation they need to have with themselves. They're able to listen in a quality of a different way. And we've been doing research around the different modes of listening. Um, and the three levels of listening that coaches might use is listening to understand, um, where, you're trying, where you're listening to how you make sense of what the client is saying, listening to help the client understand, which is where you make sense or, or try and understand how they are making sense of what they're saying, and then listening without intent, which is essentially listening intuitively, what's happening here, what the, that you've got the gestalt, and what's happening in me, what's happening in the, in, 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 in the client, what's happening in the, in, in the space between us. Um, and so this, 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 this is where the intuition comes in. And we, and we, and we know that systemic eclectics um, are pretty good, on the whole, at allowing their intuition to inform their curiosity. So, and I express it that way because it doesn't mean to say that they say, all right, I believe my intuition, you know, because it might be wrong. But their intuition creates the curiosity about, I wonder what's happening here and allows them to explore that with the client. So it's, it's a distinction there. It's a moot distinction, but I think it's an important and nuanced one. These people are marvelous. The energy that is in the room with the models based coach is dissipated everywhere. There's a lot of noise and faff, but there's not much, not, not much um, that comes out of it. With the systemic eclectic coaches, it's brilliant. The, uh, the, there is stillness. They are calm. But what you get 
is there's sort of electricity in the air. Um, and I, I, those of you who've been privileged to, 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 to sit in and, and watch a, 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 a systemic eclectic work coach at work, uh, it is a wonderful experience. Um, and they, do, they achieve so much more by doing so much less. And I, I collect powerful questions. You know, we, we've got a, the Lee book of, of, of 70 different situations with a minimum of 10 powerful questions each. You know, like, um, um, what does your team really need you for? Um, um, you know, or how would you explain this to your children or to your mother? Um, those, kinds of, those kinds of questions. Or one of my favorites was sent in to me by a, um, a South African lady, um, a South African Jewish lady. You understand why I make that comment when I say the question. It was, do you have the courage to feel happier than your mother? Isn't that a sort of knife-twisting question? Um, <clears throat> but the point is that almost all, when we gather questions from these assessment centers, Virtually every, every powerful question came from a level three or a level four coach. And the great thing, of course, is it doesn't matter where you are on this journey through these mindsets because you could be helpful to clients at any one of those levels. But when we're talking about mastery and somebody says, I'm a master coach, and we assess them and they're at level two, we say, no, you're not. You might have got this, you know, you might have done the hours, doesn't make you a master coach. I think that distinction is a, is a really important one to make. So what about the, uh, what else can we say? Oh yeah, taboo topics. Um, we've got an article coming out in the Coaching at Work soon about taboo topics in, in coaching. Things that you don't like to talk about. Some of the taboo topics we've identified, we've been, and if you've got any more that you can send us, we, we, we're doing some research and collecting these. So the things that coaches don't want to talk about. Right? So here are some of them. Um, collusion, like um, we did research with Ashridge um, to, look, to look at um, a coaches, at, at leaders' at attitudes towards their own development. We found that actually um, leaders were, on average, uh, generally, avoidant of personal development. And so what happens a lot is this collusive, collusive coaching. You are the coach for somebody as, so they can abdicate actually having to do anything about their development. Yes, well, I've got a coach, so that sorts that one. Tick. And this happens frequently. Um, the taboo of sexual attraction. Feeling attracted to or finding your clients is sexually attracted to you. The frisson of this. When you, when you actually select clients, do you actually gravitate more towards clients who you think are good looking than not? I mean, okay, we laugh, but these are real issues. Um, the... <laughs> The validation of outcomes. You know, when we actually look at the, uh, what, what, what did we achieve? Are the methods we use actually worth anything? Um, when it's just self-report and, and, and there's an interest, everybody's in, no, you know, nobody wants to say this was a complete waste of time. Because then that was, meant, meant the, the, if, if you're the coachee, you don't want to do that because that means that make, makes you, you look stupid. Um, and if you're the person who's paid for it, you certainly don't want to hear that. So nobody's ever going to say it was a waste of time. We had a nice chat, but nothing happened. Um, um, uh, you, so, so basically, you know, even 360 primarily has, uh, has some real difficulties in terms of, of validation. Um, the durability issue. How many of you routinely go back to your clients two years later and find out how much they, what, whether things have embedded, the changes that happened? Do they, are, they still, are they still behaving better? Or have they stuck? Does anybody go back to their clients? And what, okay, two of you? Okay, there's a question for you then. Yeah. What actually has happened? Have the things that they said they were going to do, are they, are, has the change stuck? Or have they reverted back to normal? Um, the, the, the coaches' needs versus the clients' needs. Coaches frequently need to have a solution. You know, when, when we go into the client, if we feel that we've come out of a coaching session and the client hasn't come away with something they can do. We feel we've failed. And yet, a high proportion of the time, all the client needs is to have advanced in their thinking. This whole thing about goals, about goals you know, we, 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 coaches get fixated on the need for goals. goals the, word, the word goal means a limit or boundary. You know, are we trying to create limit, limits or boundaries on our, on our clients? The heck we are. 
We try to actually open up horizons for them, help them to think about other things. All the research that we've been doing around goals tells us that most of what we see in the textbooks is simplistic and wrong. That goals are, that, that's actually goal management, the, 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 the seeking of goals, is something that evolves. One particular study in, 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 from, from the Harvard team found, it looked at 200 American coaches, and American coaches are far more goal-oriented than European ones. It found it, when it, it, 190 of those coaches said, a large proportion of the time, whatever the goal we start out with is not the goal that we end up working on. So the more fixated you are on a goal and having a smart goal up front, the more likely you are to be wasting your time and the client's. Um, we basically need to get away from being, from being held to ransom by goals, particularly if those goals are not the client's own, or set by somebody else, their, their boss or somebody else. We need to get away from all of this. And so there's a whole range of these, these other, other taboos, um, which, um, which I thought some are fun. Coach envy, or coach envy is a, is a lovely one. Um, it's where the person that you're coaching is so much more successful than you are. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and you feel you, and you can't help but feel envious of them and their privilege and their position, their nice and their nice car. Um, you felt if you felt that, <laughs> join the club. Um, <laughs> it's it's there. It's, with all of these taboos, we don't talk about them at all. Um, have you got a coach development plan? No. Every coach needs to have a coach development plan, a, a, a sheer program that shows step by step how are you going to grow and develop as a coach. How are, you, what, how are you going to be different in 12 months' time as a coach than you are now? What's the critical learning you need to do, your skills, your knowledge? How, how do you need to grow your business? What, do you need, what is your coach development plan? Um, how are you going to use supervision? Um, and what we find is that, is, is that there's an attitude. If you think that coaching is something you do to other people, you are probably going to, to go to supervision with the sense that supervision is something that's done to you. And therefore, you are not going to be a full partner in that process. Um, so there's some real challenges there, there, there I think. Um, and the last thing I'll, I'll mention is, is, is well-being. How do you look after yourself? You know, here we are, desperately trying to help all these people. We, you know, we're spreading out our, our generosity, our, our love for all these people, trying to help them become whole persons. Yeah. Um, how much actual time and energy do we spend on making sure that we are fully functioning whole people. Um, if we're not spending an, that sort of time on ourselves, if we're not, for example, regularly stopping and thinking, what is my purpose as a coach? Why am I bothering to do this? Yeah. Um, how do I actually make myself um, more, more healthier, um, more integrated, more at peace with myself? How am I, how come I, how can I be more kind to myself? It's a lovely question. Yeah. What did you do that was kind to yourself this week? You see the kind of questions that, that, that we I think we, 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 we are at a point in the de development of coaching where we, can, where we have to start stop, to stop thinking about this is the way we do it, these are the processes, these are the models and all the rest of it, and have to think about what are the questions that we need to be asking ourselves so that we are better prepared to ask the right questions of our clients so they could become fully functioning individuals within themselves and within the systems of which they're a part. I mean, I personally believe that most, that effective coaching uh, leaves the client in a place where they do the rest, where they self-coach themselves a great deal before, before, between that point and when they meet you next. If they haven't advanced in their thinking between one coaching session and the next, I'm questioning what's wrong. Um, and so that, that's, I think that's another important question we need to ask ourselves. You know, has the client advanced in their own thinking while we've been away, or is it still just dependent on me? Um, and from the diversity point of view, absolutely agree um, that we did um, some, gather some data some years ago around um, diversity mentoring, uh, and one of the, some of the case studies that we had were quite horrendous, where um, people would not mention the fact that somebody was in a wheelchair. Yeah, you know, a, a year's relationship, meeting once a month, and you didn't mention the wheelchair because you were afraid you would offend. Um, and but basically, people thought that was highly demeaning to them. And so, I, so having these open discussions, uh, I think, yes, the, the, the diversity taboo is an enormous one. We all got our own personal taboos as well, as well of course. 
things that we don't want, where places where we don't want to go. Um, and just being aware of all, of all of these, bringing these as things to supervision. Um, using our supervision to help us grow as more aware individuals helps us to become more aware coaches. Thank you. Well, an excellent and thought-provoking opening keynote. Thank you again, Professor David Clutterbuck. Quick bit.